and welcome to the DeGroot School of Business Business One Orientation and Registration Session. Um, thank you for coming and taking your busy day on a Saturday and it is beautiful out there. I'm sure you're, the students, more importantly, would like to be uh, somewhere else, but thank you for coming. Um, how far did everybody come? Everybody from the local GTA area? Sign of hands? Toronto? Who's farther than Toronto? You, how, where are you from? Uh, we're from like an hour south of Cornwall. Oh, hour wow. south of Cornwall? Ottawa. Ottawa, Ottawa. 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 wow. Where Ottawa. are you from? That's Chatham. Chatham. I was born in Windsor. Oh yeah. Hey Chatham. <laughs> Anywhere buddy farther away? No? But still, thank you for coming. And um, my name is Laura Hill. I am the um, academic advisor in the DeGroote School of Business. There are four of us. I'm one of four. And I want to congratulate the students here today for their acceptance into the first year program in, in the DeGroote School of Business. You are actually in the Commerce program. So I know you worked very hard this past year in your grade 12 trying to achieve the grades that you need to get into the program. So I want to congratulate you and I think we all should give you a round of applause. I know you all suffer, I'm a parent as well, um, and hoping your, your daughter or son do get the grades to get in, so uh, I'm sure it's a big relief, and maybe it's a big scare now that you're going to university. Um, I will pass the torch on to Alex. She is going to um, talk about first year, but maybe first before we do that, I'm gonna bring everybody up. I have a great crew of volunteers here today. These are upper level commerce students. Please all come up and let's have just a quick hello and introduce yourselves and tell me what level you're in and um, move on. Hi guys. Uh, well, first of all, welcome to McMaster. You guys have done a great decision to have come here. Uh, my name is Natalia and I just finished my third year of uh, commerce. I have been part of an exchange program last year. I traveled to France for a semester, did my courses there. I'm currently on internship at the FASCO, so that's taking about 16 months to do. And then I'll be coming back in uh, September 2017 for my final year. Uh, I've had a great time here at McMaster, and I'm sure you will too. Hi everyone, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm in Talking and feel free to reach out to me afterwards. And my name is Della. I'm also going into my 
second year, you will see a lot of me during welcome week as well. I'm one of the first year orientation coordinators, which later on in the presentation you'll learn more about, but hopefully you're interested in. And like most of you, I also don't know what I'm going into yet, so you're not alone. Hi, my name is Nero. I am going to my final fourth year of commerce. I'm majoring in finance, minoring in French. I am also an off-campus SOX rep for Welcome Week, so you will see a lot of me, and I'm also a TA for some selected second year courses. I really hope you guys have an awesome time at Mac because these are the best four years of your life. Potentially five. Potentially more. <laughs> Hopefully six. Hey guys, uh, my name is Steph. I'm going into my second year of commerce. I'm hoping to stream of marketing later on. Uh, I'm also, like everyone except for me, got the a green suit rep. And I'm also VP of Marketing for the Degree Commerce Society. So if you ever have any questions about getting involved or any ideas for future years, like come say hi. I love talking to people. Fun fact, if you're on the Degree 2020 page, I'm also the one who spams the page. I apologize, but I mean, <laughs> most of the information is useful, I hope. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Sushan. I'll be entering my fifth year. I'm doing a major in accounting and I'm currently working at KPMG. Hi, my name is Sushan. Okay, without my volunteers, we would not be able to run this session, so I thank you all very much. Um, as you can see, a lot of them are right across the board. A few students just finished first year and look at them. They're up here helping and involved. Um, and right through to fourth and fifth year, I've had a few of these students help me every year with the sessions. They're greatly involved and it's inspiring. I hope it is for the students coming into first year. So now I will pass it on to Alex. She's going to uh, give you the first part of our presentation. Can you hear me if I don't use the mic? I'm, I've been told I'm loud, so. Is that okay? Are we good? Lovely. You're so. good in the back? You can hear her okay? Yeah? Okay. Just because I'm not that coordinated, so I think using all three at once would really end in a bad situation. Um, so off the top, I know we have students and parents here, and both of you might be feeling a mix of these emotions, but uh, how are you guys feeling today? You must be pretty excited, right? I, I don't know if your exams are done with high school. Who still has exams? Oh, well, thank you for coming out and taking the time away from your studying schedule to be here with us. Um, has everyone had their graduations? Yeah, no, that's a pretty exciting time. But I'd like to say that as much as that is exciting and whatnot, enjoy it, but this is probably even more exciting. Because you're about to enter, people say it's the best four or five years of your life, and it's not really an exaggeration. It's pretty, it's pretty literal. Um, but it's okay if you're nervous, and it's okay if you're scared. It's a totally different environment. It's a big change. Um, the change from grade eight to grade nine is always a kind of a big change for people. And it's the same sort of transition when you're coming to university. That being said, there's a lot more people in the same shoes as you, and there's a lot of people like us that are here to help you. So I wish I had had someone in a green suit when I was in grade nine, entering into high school. Would have made things a little easier. So off the top, 50. That number is pretty significant because our presentation today has been broken up into 50 minute segments. And the reason being is your typical lecture um, for a first year class, given that it's not a night class, will be 50 minutes in length. So we're going to try to mirror that today. Um, so after our 50 minutes, we're gonna take a break. You'll see you have some surveys out on your desk. If you don't mind filling those out for us, that'd be great. We'll be collecting them in the breaks. They're anonymous, so feel free to be 100% honest. We're not gonna, it will not affect your first year 1D03 mark um, with what you write on that survey. But it's just general feedback to help us help other years of uh, incoming first year students. So that's the reason why it's going to broke up to 50 minutes. So, like I said, we have our 50 minute segments. The first one is just going to be a general introduction to um, business and commerce. So, basic questions and whatnot. Now we're going to get into the technical stuff. Whoops. So, how do I register for courses? Um, I'm sure you've all heard of this Mosaic platform, and that's how you enroll for your courses and whatnot. Um, there's also Avenue to Learn, and that's where a lot of documents used in your courses and marks and assignments are handed in. Um, so that'll all be explained to you in detail. And then we'll end it off with the student experience. And there's two portions to that. There'll be the presentation portion, where we'll talk about things like exchange and internship and clubs and committees that you can get involved in. Um, and then we'll also be leading some tours, if you guys are interested. There'll be student-led tours of places that we think are 
pretty commonly visited while you're on campus. If you have anywhere else you want to go to, volunteers will be more than happy to show you, but that'll be up to you guys if you want to attend those at the end. Um, let's get started. So, the student experience um, academic office is will be located in the DeGroote School of Business. Um, it'll be in the main lobby. It's currently being renovated right now, so you might not see it on your tour, but it is there, and it will be there in September. Um, there's all the information about how you can contact them and whatnot. But what's really important about that office is that they're your connection, or uh, they're, they're there to help you if you have an issue with an exam or a conflict, um, if you need to find any academic guidance or counseling and things like that. They're the office of the people you want to talk to. Um, one thing to know, the email that's listed there, you can only contact them with your McMaster email, and that's just for privacy and security reasons. Um, anyone could really be using your Gmail or, or things like that, so if you're ever going to contact them, make sure it's with your McMaster email. Have you guys all got your Mac IDs and your Mac emails? Yes, no, no yes? Okay, there's no response, I'm gonna go with the yes on that one. Yeah, so your Mac email is just always going to be, it's a really simple formula. Your Mac ID, so for me, that's the first couple letters of my last name and my first name meshed together, and then at McMaster.ca. So if you know your Mac ID, but you don't know your Mac email, you actually do know your Mac email, because it's just your Mac ID at McMaster.ca. Does that make sense? Are we all clear with that? Questions? No? Okay. So. If you have questions about things, whether you're throughout the summer or when you're in first year or whether you're in third year, great email to reach out to. So with that being said, you have um, faculty that are there to help you in the experience office, but then you also have students that are here to help you and kind of get you climatized to the Mac environment. Um, and that, those students are the DeGroote Commerce Society. So you. We'll meet a couple of, of representatives from um, that, I guess you want to say, elevated student council. <laughs> but uh, they're there to help you throughout the year. They plan lots of different events um, and they monitor the Facebook pages and whatnot. So both the Facebook and the Twitter there are pretty, pretty key to follow and to stay up to date with. Um, it's the easiest and best way for us to promote our events and it's, it's really easy to sign up to. Um, feel free to follow those. Now, before I get to campus in the fall, these are kind of the three main things that you need to do. So first is your account setup. I had asked if everyone knew what their Mac ID and Mac email was, and it seemed to be the consensus that we all did. So given that information, you need to activate your Mac ID on Mosaic. We'll go through in more detail how to do that um, with some step-by-step -step guides to figure out Mosaic. Um, but that is something that you need to do in order to look at courses and eventually enroll in courses. So once you log into Mosaic and everything's good and rolling, you'll be able to see a learning plan and it shows you which courses that you need to complete to be completing in first year, complete first year, um, and then you can enroll in those courses. I believe you all have been assigned a date to enroll and it's either June 29th or June 30th. So ideally, it'd be great to set up your account and start looking at courses a little bit of time before then. Um, that way, when you sign on on the 29th and 30th, it's smooth sailing. Uh, doesn't take too long to do, and it's pretty user friendly. Trust me, we used to have this other program before that that was a lot more difficult to navigate, so you are blessed to have Mosaic. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of something to do on your to-do list after this orientation. So your student card. Have you guys got your student cards yet in the mail? No? So they will be coming. Your student card is your key to life. I would say your key to success, but it's your key to life. Um, your student card will be used if you're living on residence in first year for your meal plan. Your student card would be used if you're going to the gym or the athletic center. But most importantly, you need your student card to write midterms and finals. If you don't have your student card, you're, you have a window of time that you can try to get a temporary card and whatnot, but there's, it's like half an hour or something like that, and if you exceed the half an hour time slot, which is within your exam time, um, you fail the exam. So don't lose your student card. That being said, if you do lose it, you can pay throughout the year to get a, um, a replacement card done, but if you're someone like me who loses things often, that's quite a little expense that adds up at the end of the year. 
So needless to say, hold on to that thing. It is your life. Um, you will also, once you come to campus in September, there is a bus pass that you can get with your, uh, with your student card and there'll be information on where you go to pick that up, but it allows you to use the HSR and the Hamilton buses. So if you're not living on campus, um, but you're living somewhere in the Hamilton area, that is also an opportunity for you to use that for transportation. So this was something that I was always confused in with when I started to enroll with courses. Um, because all of you will be entering and enrolling in what's called Business One. But yes, if all things go well throughout your four, and, or four or five years here, you will be graduating with a Bachelor of Commerce. So some students are confused or become confused thinking that they're in the wrong program if they're in Business One but not in Commerce. The reason being is we, just, we have different names for our programs here. Um, and each year as you move on from level to level, it kind of can change. So when you're in first year, you enroll into business one, and if all things go well, I believe you need a five in order to progress into the second year of our commerce program. You then enter commerce two. After commerce two, um, depending on, again, your grades, you will either enter into honors commerce, and that's an honors commerce level three and level four, and then you graduate and do wonderful things, or you enter into just a bachelor of commerce. The difference between the two is to get an honors commerce degree, um, a bachelor of honors, what they call it you need to also carry that cumulative five average throughout um, and when you have an honors degree or, or in the honors program there's more of a selection of commerce electives that are available to you later on when you're in third and fourth year and that can be really handy if you're going into something like finance and you want to take a really specialized security analysis course so just keep that in mind there's a you always get that rumor when you're entering into first year that oh my first year marks don't count <laughs> they do um, they do not only for things like this, but also for the internship and exchange program, which I'll talk to you about later. You need an average in order to be able to complete one of those. So take your first year courses seriously. Um, there is always time to have fun, but you have to remember why you're here. Does that kind of clarify any questions about that? Are we all good? You're entering into business, but you will slowly become commerce students. You're still part of our program. It's still the same thing. We're business students too. We just completed first year. So when you're looking um, at courses on Mosaic, uh, once you've activated your ID and you're in the planning stage, this is what a typical course structure would look like for all faculties, not just commerce courses. So there's three main things to look at when you're kind of four. First would be the faculty. So this was an engineering course. It would say engineering 1 EO3. So most of your courses will be commerce. You do have electives that are out of the faculty, but mostly commerce. The number. The one that indicates the level so that's a first year course so when you're enrolling in planning um, don't don't enroll in second third or fourth anything that starts other than a one don't go there um, the E that's just a unique identifier it really has no meaning to you um, it just used to d differentiate the courses then one other thing to keynote is the O3 or it'll say O6 and that just indicates the length of the course so if a course um, has the suffix of 03. That means it's a semester course, so it's either first semester or second semester. If it says 06, that means it's a full year course, which means it spans from first semester all the way to second semester, from September to the end of April. If you're kind of confused by that um, and thinking, oh, so do I not have an exam halfway? Your midterm will happen when your one semester courses have their exam. So a one semester course, an O3 course, will start in September, have exams in September, in December, and then you're done, and you have new courses that start in January. Whereas an O6 course will start in September, you'll have a midterm in December during your December final exams, and then it'll finish and have, you'll have your final exam in April. Does that make sense to everyone? It really isn't that big of a factor, but it's something to consider when you're trying to plan out your schedule. Um, that way you don't accidentally overload one semester and underload on the next. Any questions? I speak kind of fast, so if anyone thinks I'm going like way too quickly, just please tell me to slow down. Are we good? Yeah? Okay. Oh, and I'm done. <laughs> I come back though, so next time. So while we're talking, if you have a question, please put your hand up, ask questions. I want this to be informal. Um, if you have any, ask questions. You're very quiet. 
Hello everyone, can you all hear me at the back? Yeah, I need the microphone, I can't be quite that loud. Um, so, does anyone have any guesses as to what this 30 stands for based on what we just heard about? Yeah? Yes, exactly. So, for those of you who didn't hear, you need to take 30 units per academic year. So what this works out to be is 10 courses throughout your time between September and April, or five courses typically per term. So over your four years, you're going to end up taking 120 units, which is 40 courses, and I know sounds like so many, but I promise you it will fly by. Okay, so let's look at how those courses are going to be structured. First, focus on the top branch um, labeled fall winter terms. So the fall term runs from September to December, while the winter term runs from January to April. So this together comprises what is the standard academic year. McMaster also offers courses in the summer, so we have two terms in the summer as well, which would be the spring term from May to June and the summer term from June to August. So courses that you take during these terms will be on an accelerated basis, so obviously you can see that they're half the amount of time. So a course that is, say, taken in the fall and is, has three hours of lecture every week, you'll have six hours of lecture every week for the same course taken during the spring or summer term. So I would highly recommend taking courses during the spring or summer term. I've done it every year. Um, for me, it was a great way to try and lighten up your load throughout the school year. So if you take, say, two courses during the spring and summer terms, then you can take four and four during the actual academic year. Does anyone have any questions? No? Okay, so then that leads into a discussion of what constitutes a full-time versus a part-time student. So a full-time student is someone who takes between 18 and 30 units during the academic year. So this would be between six and 10 courses. A student who takes any less than that would be classified as a part-time student. So, the decision as to whether you want to study on a full-time or part-time basis is totally up to you, um, but it is important to note that most of you coming straight from high school will be receiving entrance scholarships, and in order to uh, receive those scholarships, you have to maintain a full-time status between September and April. Okay, this is the fun part. It's the courses that you have to take during your first year. So in your little booklet, you should each have a page that looks like this. So if you want to just pull it out, we can follow along together. Awesome. Okay, so the first course on this list is Commerce 1A3, which is an introductory finance, or sorry, an introductory accounting course. Um, which is offered in the first term. You also have to take organizational behavior offered in both terms one and two. I would personally recommend taking it during the second term because there's a lot of group work involved with the class. Um, so you may prefer to have that first term under your belt so that you have all the skills and habits that you need in order to perform to the best of your ability within a group. Next, we have Commerce 1 EO3, which was my absolute favorite course in first year. Um, it's an overview of business environment and organization. It's a really good foundational course, um, which will provide you with a lot of the information that you may need for some of your more advanced courses throughout your four years here. We also have Commerce 1 DEO. Does anyone notice anything a little bit strange about this? Yeah. Exactly, there's no credits, but it is mandatory, so make sure that you are enrolled in this course. So Commerce One DEO only runs for the first five weeks of the term, and it provides an opportunity for you to learn more about the program, to get uh, more information about extracurriculars that you can get involved in, options for specialization, that type of thing. So even though you don't get any credits for it, it certainly is worthwhile, and you all need to take it. So we also have economics. We have two required economics courses that you take in first year. So there's micro and macro. Typically we suggest that you break these up if possible, so do one in each term. Okay, the math is where it can get a little bit confusing because all of you are going to have to take different courses. 
So if I could get all the students to stand up. right now, you all have to take Math 1 MO3 in your second term, okay? Now, if you took calculus in high school, sit down. Perfect. If you're still standing, you also need to take Math 1 FO3 during your first term, okay? Does anyone have any questions? No? Okay, now everyone else stand back up. <laughs> Now you can sit down if you took data management in high school. Okay, so if you're still standing, you have to take statistics 1L03, which is the equivalent to data management in high school. Okay, so you can all sit down. Um, if anyone isn't clear on which math courses you need to take, before you leave today, make sure you talk to one of the volunteers, um, and we can definitely help you figure out which of the math courses you need. Okay, so then in addition to that, we also get to take electives. So the number of electives that you can take will depend on how many of the math courses that you need to take. So this can range anywhere between six and 12. So the biggest piece of advice that I can give you for electives is take something that you find interesting. I would highly suggest that you don't go looking for what other people call bird courses. Look for something that you're interested in because something that you're super interested in will be easier for you, right? So everyone's gonna have different courses that they prefer to take as their electives. Do you have something to add, Lori? So when you're going to go into enroll, and we're going to get to that a little bit later, everybody has to take all the required courses, which are Commerce 1 EO3, Commerce 1 AA, Commerce 1 BA, Commerce 1 DEO, which is not a credit course. You're going to have that zero credit course in your first term. You have to take the two econs, 1B, 1BB. You have to do the math. So for three commerce that count, the two econs, the math. If you do not have to take the Math 1F or the Stats 1L, you have um, 18 units of required course, and to total 20, you will add 12 units of elective. Does that make sense? If you have to take Math 1F or Stats 1L, that will put you up to 21 units of required course, and then you would need nine units of elective. So everyone is different in their first year as to the number of required courses and electives that you take. Do you understand that? Also, when you're enrolling, um, make sure you do an even course load, 15 units in term one, which is five courses and 15 units in term two. You cannot go over the 30 units. That is the maximum you can enroll into. You can go below the 30 if you wish to, but you will be missing some coursework because you do need to complete 30 units in each year to make a whole total of 120 over the four years. Whether you do it in your four years or five years or six years is completely up to you. But you do have to be sure that you have 30 units each year to complete each year. You can go into second year if you have 24 units of credit at the end of your first year, but that must include all your required courses, and you're gonna to get to that, right? But I wanted to stress that it has to include your required courses and you can only be outstanding electives. And if you are outstanding, you do need to make it up if you're trying to do this in the four years. And that would be summer school. And Ailish is now going to move along and tell you more about that. Okay. Um, so then we can move on because I'm sure you all want to know how you, oh yeah. Yeah, so the question was, where can you find a description of the electives that you have the options to take? So online, if you search for the McMaster undergraduate calendar, um, you can go through and you can look at an explanation of each course. Within that, you can also see the prerequisites for the course. So for any elective that you take, you just need to ensure that you meet the prerequisites of course as well. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Are there any other questions? No? Okay, awesome. So, 
This is McMaster's grading scale. It's a little bit different than what most of you are probably used to. So we use a 12 point scale, which can be then converted to either percentages or letter grades, maybe something you're a little bit more comfortable with. So typically your professors will provide you with marks on your assignments in the form of either percentages or letters, which you can then convert over to McMaster's grading scale. Okay, so of course you're all coming into level one now, but I'm sure you would like to stay for level two. So <laughs> you'll need to maintain a GPA of a five, which if we looked back at our scale, we would see is a C or a minimum of a 63%. So just think about that for a second, because in order to come into the commerce program here as a group, you all have to maintain an average of 82.5 in high school. So we're only asking that you maintain an average of 63 in order to continue in the program. So just keep that in mind when you're coming in and make sure that you have realistic expectations for your grades because chances are they will fall a little bit. Um, it's also important to note that you are able to fail a course in your first year as long as you fail no more than one required course and no more than six units in total in order to continue. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay, so I will pass this off to Alex now. Yeah. Just a quick note this? about failing. If you happen to fail the course, it counts as a zero in your GPA. If you remember that chart that we had on earlier about the A, B, C, D, a zero, uh, an F, counts as zero, and it will count in your GPA. So even if you do fail a required course or you fail two electives, as long as you have a five GPA, you can continue in the program. Okay, but that zero could affect your average you coming down below the five. If you go below the five, you cannot continue into second year honors. Any questions so far? We're doing such a great job. Wow. <laughs> so who would be interested? and going on an exchange throughout their time at Mac. Really, that's why they're more hands off. That actually breaks my heart. No, maybe, okay. I can. I kid you not, I went on exchange um, in third year, second semester, I went to the Netherlands for a semester. So I lived there from January to June and it was single-handedly the best experience of my life and I'm not just saying that. Um, exchange allows you to not only travel while you're studying, uh, you meet people from all over the world and you make pretty amazing friendships and get to do some pretty crazy things. If you are interested in going on exchange, you have to work for it a little. There is a minimum GPA that's required to apply. So you need to maintain a seven throughout your first and second year. So that's when I was saying your first year marks count. They count for things, especially like this. Um, you've applied to go on exchange at the end of your second year and you can either travel at the beginning of your third year, at the end of your third year. So you can do a semester abroad or you can do a full year abroad. You can go on exchange in your third year or in your fourth year. Oh, question, yes? Uh, what's the percentage for 7.0? What's the percentage for 7.0? I, I couldn't even tell you. 70? There you go. So it's, it's pretty manageable. Um, so you can either go in your third year or your fourth year. If you choose to do an internship, so you do your internship in your fourth year, which I'll get to, and you come back for a fifth year, you can even go on a fifth year. So uh, similar to what I did, I went on a change my third year, I went on an internship, and I'm going again in January. Yep? Oh, I see that stuff is, it's like a remote required GPA. I'm assuming that's a competitive uh, program, so what is the recommended like, GPA? How does that one change? So when you complete to apply for exchange, you have this GPA, but you also complete an application. And in your application, you write, um, it's like a thousand word kind of essay, I would say, but I use that very loosely, explaining why you want to go to the destination where you're going, et cetera, et cetera. So like you said, yes, it is somewhat competitive. Um, because it's a reciprocal program, we have partners with these 25 countries. So you can go on exchange. I went to Singapore, I went to the Netherlands, people go to Australia, you can go to the US, you can go to China. Really, there's a lot of opportunities there. And then we have students that come from those schools to our school. So of course, there's not unlimited seats available. Um, and that's why in your application, you'll actually be asked to make a top three, so a top three choices. Um, and then there's preference given to your first choice based on 
your grades, your application, and once you submit those, you actually have an interview as well. And you meet with the exchange coordinator, uh, and you get asked questions about your application and just some general questions. Um, you'll find out more about exchange throughout your time at McMaster. There's just two, a couple key things to know. Um, even if you're not in commerce, you can still go on exchange. So McMaster is a university, has a Mac abroad program, whereas for business students, we have what's called BizX. Um, and the difference really between the two is that BizX is just for business kids. And you usually go on exchanges with other business students. Uh, otherwise, there's really not too much of a difference there. There is flexibility. McMaster, in general, uh, has partnerships with more schools. So if there's a destination you really set on that isn't a biz ex school, you can still participate in a Mac abroad exchange, um, but it's just kind of easier when you go through the business school per se. The cool thing about exchange is, especially exchange at Mac, is that you pay your tuition to McMaster. So there's this preconceived notion about exchange that it's expensive. And don't get me wrong, um, if you choose to travel every weekend and do fun and crazy things, yes it does add up, I can speak from experience. But um, with regards to paying actual tuition, you pay the same amount that you would if you were a student attending McMaster for a semester here in Hamilton. So that amount doesn't increase, which is pretty awesome because when you go to study abroad, usually you have to pay international student fees. And they're usually more expensive than the regular tuition. So I think that's a pretty neat feature that a lot of kids don't know about that helps when you're trying to subsidize the cost of your exchange. Also, there is a McMaster exchange grant or scholarship that if you meet this minimum requirement of a, a 7 GPA, uh, actually, to be honest, I don't know if there's a cap on how many of these scholarships they distribute, but they give you $1,000. So personally, I used that $1,000 towards my flight, and that covered the cost of my round trip airplane. Um, so there is opportunities there. There's also other external exchange scholarships throughout the university that are available to people. I have lots of friends that applied for those. Um, the application deadline for that is pretty early. I unfortunately missed it, so I couldn't reap those benefits. But they got money from those scholarships and used that towards covering their housing. So yes, it could add up, but if you plan for it and it's something that you really want to do, and you know that when you're in first year, um, it's, it's definitely worth every single cent. I wouldn't be going on another exchange if I didn't actually believe that. So it's pretty awesome. Any questions about exchange? Yeah. Um, so flight is not included. Um, is where you're going to stay, is that included? No, it isn't. So it's okay. similar as if you're attending university here, right? When you pay your tuition to McMaster, it doesn't include your res cost. That's additional. Um, with that being said, my personal situation, when I lived in the Netherlands, and again, it varies country by country, but rent was actually cheaper there than what I paid here. Um, and when I got the cost of my flight covered, uh, I guess you could say that my cost of living on exchange was more affordable than it was here. Um, so don't, again, rule that out just because it's going to be another expense. If you're going to be a student living off campus anyways in Hamilton, you're going to have to be paid for rent. Um, so, yeah. Can I answer your question? Yes. Any other questions about exchange? I honestly cannot stress enough. Maybe if it's something that doesn't interest you now, but keep it in the back of your mind, per se, because there's not a lot of opportunities you get to travel the world and get courses to do it. Oh, and I forgot the most important part. When you're on exchange, this is going to be a, a deal breaker, I think. When you're on exchange, your courses are pass-fail. So that whole like 12-point grade scheme does not exist. You either just need to pass the course, um, no, you just pass the course. You're not going to fill a course. So you're just going to pass it, uh, which is great. Right? Like, so when your friends are studying and you're traveling and you're kind of like afraid because you shouldn't be studying, it's OK. Because you just, you're going to pass. You are. So it's great. Does that maybe change some people's opinions now? <laughs> Uh, I see two questions. I saw here first, then here. Um, so would that count towards your GPA? So it just pops up on your transcript as a pass, and then it doesn't affect like, your grade. It doesn't bring down your overall GPA. Would it affect the like all the courses that you're taking, uh, like, the amount of courses that you have to take for to graduate? No, because it adds, it's added towards that. That being said, if you're going into accounting as your major, talk to Sushan or I afterwards, because CPA requirements, there's only certain courses you can do outside of Canada. Um, so because I was going into accounting and majoring in accounting, I did summer school to get those courses done in, in this country so that I could do other courses abroad. So talk to us after if you're interested in doing exchange and you want to do accounting. Um, yes, there was another question. You're, oh, okay. Any other questions? Okay. So third year, you can do, or fourth year, you can do exchange, 
Then in fourth year, you can do internship. So how many people would be interested or thinking about doing internship? And like every hand should be up here. You, it's a paid internship, which is pretty hard to come by. Paid internship with great work experience as a student. So what makes McMaster different than a school such as Laurier or Waterloo, where there's a built-in co-op into their program, is that we don't have a co-op. A co-op is you work, you study, you work, you study. So you have these chunks of time where you're forced to be outside of school doing work. Our internship is 100% optional. You don't have to participate in this program. If you do, you complete the internship, and it's either a 12-month internship or a 16-month internship in your fourth year, and then you come back and you do a fifth year. Um, in order to apply, to do your internship, you need to have an average of seven again. So uh, there's common trends here. Seven is kind of the average that you need to have. So you decide whether or not you're interested in doing internship at the end of your second, at the end of your um, second year, and then you apply for the internship program, which we call it 3INO, that's the course code. And if you're going on internship in your first semester or third year, you'll complete this course called 3INO. It's not a graded course, it's another pass-fail course. And what the course does is it prepares you for the corporate work environment. So we teach you how to make, like, or polish your resume, your cover letter, um, interview tips, things like that. There's speakers that come in. Um, it's mandatory attendance, that's how you pass the course. And once you've passed, it'll be at the end of your uh, semester, so in December. The job board opens up in January, and then you get access to the job board. And you go through the whole interview process. So there's tons of companies that um, partner with McMaster to hire for internship. And they will post these jobs on the job board. You can apply with your cover letter, cover letter and resume, and then they do mostly on campus, but there's some off campus, but mostly on campus, interviews. Um, and there's different rounds, so there's three rounds of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Not every student in the program will get a job. So you still have to try and work and interview and network, et cetera, et cetera. But the placement rate, I would say, is extremely, extremely high. I don't know off the top of my head, but I think every person I know that's that internship has got an internship. You know, right? What? Oh, it's definitely three, I know. Getting a job. It's pretty high. It's not something to be like, oh, I don't think I'm going to get a job. Um, and it's great because again it's paid. So you get some work experience and then you come back and you get to join all your friends again at school. Any questions about that? No? Yes? Uh, Sorry, I honestly could not hear you. <laughs> no, so you don't pay full tuition, you pay a I don't know if it's going to change, so I'm not going to give out the number, but it's a fraction of the tuition that you pay um, as a fee in order to enter into the program, and that covers the cost of when you're on the job, you have people from the school come out and they um, they meet with your boss and whatnot, and you have on-site visits and things like that. It also covers any of the administration fees with regards to the job board and stuff, and it covers the cost of the three annual course. Um, it's not like thousands and thousands of dollars, it's just a fee. It's really not bad at all. But. Any other questions? Wow, I answered every question. Okay. Yeah. All right. So just before I start off with minors, I just wanted to add on to what Alex was talking about. Uh, both, I both, I also did exchange, and it was a wonderful experience. And I am currently on my internship. Both of them are totally manageable. You can do both without any problem, without it disrupting your courses. So don't worry about that. If you're able to do both, do both. They'll be a great uh, thing to experience and a thing to add to your resume as well. So, minors. So it's just a way uh, to add a little bit of a dimension to uh, what you graduate with, basically. So minors uh, are, usually, are for the students that are in their fourth or fifth years, and they consist of uh, courses that are outside of commerce, um, and have 24 units uh, to them. So a lot, a lot of what students do is uh, use what the courses that they have already gotten that are mandatory in their uh, program and use those to build off uh, a minor. For example, economics, uh, you can finish the economics minor very easily because you have your two uh, economics in first year, your micro and macro, and then in second year you also have uh, I forgot.
forgot what the title is of the course right now, but it is another economics course, 2XO3. Yes. <laughs> And uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the finance courses also goes towards your uh, A3 also goes towards your uh, economics minor if you're interested in that. But you're also able to do many other minors. Uh, a lot of business students also do computer science. Uh, so you can do political science, things like that. We also have a new program uh, minor in place that's an interdisciplinary uh, minor in sustainability. And it's a wide range of courses uh, that you can take that kind of bring together this minor and we have brochures up here with more information <coughs> on that it's uh, brand new and you can learn more about that through that through the brochure um, so study breaks so you might not have a March break but you do get two three study breaks uh, throughout your time uh, during your two semesters one of them, which was just recently introduced last uh, year, was the one in the fall. And these, uh, these uh, midterm breaks, they allow you to kind of uh, have a time to kind of take it easy uh, with whatever, course, uh, whatever courses and assignments that you have going on, just so that you can focus, because this is really all about you. Because we know that it's tough to transition into university, so we want you guys to have a little bit of time to kind of catch up on what you need, whether it's your uh, schoolwork or you know sleep in most cases. Um, but yes, yeah, so this year it's going to be running from October 10th to 16th, and uh, it falls during Thanksgiving uh, uh, day as well. So you'll have a chance to enjoy some turkey at home. But there's also one in uh, for the winter break, but that's after exams. So you'll have those uh, two weeks to be with family or. Travel if you really want to, but you have that break. Uh, as well as another uh, break in February, mid February. So that's kind of the what everyone considers a spring <laughs> spring break, even though it's usually quite snowy outside. But <laughs> uh, it's a great time for you to really catch up on your studies. Uh, don't think of it as a time to kind of let loose and forget that you're in school because it really is worth it to use your time wisely during that week. Uh, your exam periods, uh, they happen at the end of your first term and your second term. So uh, this year from December 9th to 22nd, you'll be doing your semester one exams. And same thing, winter term, you'll have at the end of your second term, April 11th to 27th. So uh, these exams, uh, the schedule comes out uh, usually mid-semester uh, near the before, a good chunk before exams actually start. And it's a good idea not to plan any trips until you are done your exams. Because even though your exams might say you have an exam on the 18th, for example, and you have tickets to go out, uh, I don't know, to uh, Cuba the next day, this might not always be uh, easy thing for you to do because if there's, a, for example, a snowstorm on one of the days, your exams can get pushed to another date uh, in the exam period, okay? So if you are interested in going away with your family, going on some sort of trip, uh, going back home, depending where you're from, wait till your exams are done. You don't know what can happen and if you don't do your exam, uh, it's very uh, difficult for you to do it at a later time. This isn't high school, you can't ask your your professor to uh, do it the next day or the day before. Uh, the teachers don't care if you're going on vacation, okay? Uh, if for whatever reason you do miss an exam, there are there is a deferred exam schedule, but you do need um, to go through a process to actually get to that uh, exam stage. <coughs> is there any questions on exams? So, miss coursework, because sometimes emergencies do happen. You might have had a family emergency, you may have gotten the flu all of a sudden, and well, what about the, the midterm you have tomorrow or the assignment that you have to hand in today? So, we do have a McMaster student absence form, otherwise known as MSAP, and you're gonna hear it a lot during your time here. You're gonna hear your friends, oh, I gotta MSAP this, I gotta MSAP that. Um, and it's a really a great thing to do when you kind of find yourself in these sticky situations because um, it helps you, I guess, still keep, somehow get that mark if you're about to miss something. So you only get one per term, um, and it's during, uh, 
what is the grace period? Three days? Three days. So yes, thank you. So it's three days um, where if you, once you submit your one MSAF, you can put whatever uh, assignment, midterm, uh, tests or quizzes that you might have that are under 25% uh, of worth of your mark. So um, if on Monday you realize you have uh, flu and you don't think you're, you'll be able to uh, think clearly for that quiz that you have that same night, um, but you also know that you have uh, an assignment due on Wednesday that you kind of haven't started yet because, well, you've been watching too much Netflix probably, but <laughs> there's, also, uh, there's that chance that you can put all three of those because they, well sorry, two I just said, into that one submission. If you do only the one and submit it, you won't be able to put the uh, something that's two days later onto that same submission. Okay? Um, I think that was good. Any questions? All right, so we'll be moving on in a moment towards the more technical stuff, how to register for courses, how to use Mosaic. But right now we're going to be taking a five minute break, uh, just so you guys can stretch your legs. If you guys could take the time to actually fill out the questionnaires that we yes. handed out to you. Uh, it's completely anonymous, so don't worry, it's not going to affect your first year grade. Before you out, please, please sit down. I, um, I do want to introduce uh, Dr. Iman Mohammed. he is our Associate Dean, and he is going to say a few words of welcome. But while he's doing that, the students are going to come up and collect those little sheets. Um, and then we will have a break after that. So, can you come on? Yes, I'd like to. <coughs> so it turns out I'm the only one standing between you and the place. All right, I'll make it, <coughs> I'll make it quick. I just would like to welcome you on behalf of the Dean of the School of the Business and the Faculty of the School of Business. Welcome you to the group. We're talking about, you know, this is so much information to process for you. We don't expect you to know everything all the time. The purpose of this session is just to show you where to look for information. Be, be sure that you always stay, you always stay informed because the ignorance of the rules or regulations is not an excuse for, you know, is not an acceptable excuse. We have situations, unfortunately, every year where students miss graduation. They do not graduate in time just because they did not take the right courses. I'm not saying they did not take 40 courses. They actually did take 40 courses, but they were not the 40 courses to graduate. More importantly, sometimes you miss on big opportunities like scholarships. We have tons of them. Mind you, there are not lots of money. It's a couple thousand here, seven hundred dollars there, but believe me, they add up and everything counts, you know. So make sure that you always you always stay informed. Another thing I am in my civilian life, I am an accounting professor, all right? And that's what I love to do. So you will be my students in the first week of class. So I'll meet you in the first week of September. And at the time we will establish that university actually it's a whole different experience from, from high school. It's not going to be one way teaching, although I'd like to talk a lot, but I would actually like you to be a partner in your own, in your own learning. And we'll explain what that means later on. Finally, I want to emphasize that you are not alone. Keep that in mind. When you come to the DeGroote School of Business, you are part of a big family. We are here to support you. We have academic advisors. We have staff who are here whose job is to support you. So please let us know if you have any difficulties. One of the unfo unfortunate aspects of my job is dealing with petitions. At the end of the year, the grades are released. Some students find themselves, you know, getting picked out of the faculty of the university, ineligible to move to the second or third year, ineligible to graduate. And that's when they submit their petitions. Well, I had a death in the family. I had a financial difficulty. I, have, I had health issues, mental issues, emotional issues. We actually would like to know about these things before, beforehand. It's much more helpful for us 
to know, share this with us. And by the way, I guarantee you, our academic advisors are very discreet. Even I don't know the names of the students who have issues, okay? When the academic advisors approach me and they say, well, this student had, let's say, financial difficulty. Their parents got fired from a job or something like that. And they are stressed out and they cannot do the exams. We'd like you to give them deferred exam privilege. I don't know who that student is, okay? So don't be afraid. I know these issues and matters are private and you don't want them to know about it. Nobody's gonna know about it other than the academic advisors with whom you are in, okay? So please us, let, let us know, we are here for you. And again, welcome to the Degro School of Business and I look forward to seeing you in September. Thanks. So instead of showing you guys pictures, I'm actually gonna walk you through my actual account and register for a class so you can see exactly what to do. Uh, just before I start, uh, could you put up your hand if you've already activated your Mac ID? Okay, if you have not activated your Mac ID, put up your hand. Don't be shy. Okay, so everybody has Mac activated the Mac ID, which is basically the first component of your McMaster email. Uh, so the way you log into Mosaic, go to mosaic.mcmaster.ca. This is the screen you're going to see. You're going to use your Mac ID and then basically log in with the password you set, up, set it up with. And this is going to be your home screen. So a few key things in your home screen. On the left, you see it's a news component and that's McMaster White News. Uh, sometimes it's really important stuff, sometimes it doesn't even really uh, impact you as a student at all. Um, and then in the middle area, Avenue to Learn is your hub for all the classes. I'll go over it. Uh, I'll also do the whole login after I do the Mosaic uh, enrollment and I'll show you what it is. Uh, McMaster student email, so we are on a Google server. Uh, so basically, once you click on the McMaster, you have to sign on uh, on a different server site. But once you do sign on, it goes back to the Google server. Um, and that's your McMaster email. That's basically what you use to communicate to all your professors. The professors will not reply if it's not from the McMaster email. So keep that in mind. If you want any communication to be done, that's the way of communication. And you can add it to your uh, iPhones or Androids, Blackberries, whatever. You can IMAP it. Uh, and it's very straightforward, it's not hard. Uh, another key thing is the campus notifications. So there are a lot of times, you know, they do a lot of, a lot of fire alarm testing or uh, there's a security system, the red poles that you probably see on campus. So they test those or there's an emergency. Uh, there's a, uh, a way you can sign up for these notifications either via email or even getting a text. Um, and they only use it for emergencies only, so it's not a scam in any way or form. So that's that kind of portal. And the rest typically doesn't really apply to you until you uh, are in your final year. So once you're in Mosaic, the most important menu for you guys would be the student center. Uh, so once you click on that, it has four different components. So as you see, the first one is the academic, and that's where all your classes that you're taking are currently enrolled in, you will see. When you log in, you actually would not see anything here. Uh, just because you haven't had a chance to enroll. I had my enrollment last week, so that's, those are the classes that I'm currently enrolled in, and you see that. Um, to actually know when exactly you can enroll, on the right side, uh, under the enrollment date sub-menu, it will say which date, but that's not it. Everybody is assigned a different time on a different day. So we'll have to go click on details, and this is where it says, at 8 a.m. on the 22nd, I can start enrolling in classes. So every one of you would have a date either the 29th or after, and you're given, you're given a specific time, and until that time, you cannot enroll in anything. However, you can plan what you plan, what you will be taking, and that's what I'm gonna walk you through. Uh, it's a very easy process, and it saves you time once your eight o'clock actually hits, or whatever time that you have actually hits. So we're gonna go back to the student center, and I'm gonna show you how to actually set up a class. Uh, so once you're at the academic part, you're going to click on Enroll. It's going to take you to here. And basically it breaks it down by term. So I'm a master. The term that starts in September is called Fall. The term that starts in January is called Winter. So let's say I want to pick a class for the September term. So I click 2016. I go Continue. Um, I'm actually going to 
once you get a lead tag, it's under the exact same process. Okay, so this is the screen you're gonna see. So basically you have three options of choosing or finding a class. Class search, basically you're searching everything that's kind of open or offered. My requirements, so this system is actually integrated to you as a student, so it knows what your required courses are. You can do it that way. Or my planner. Uh, this is another tool you can actually plan ahead to see exactly what classes you need to take every year. But let's just do the most, uh, most used way, which is basically keep, keeping it on class search and then clicking search. It prompts you to the screen. Here, what you want to do is click on select subject. And now these are all the subjects that McMaster offers. Uh, one thing, all of our business classes are under commerce. So you go to the letter C, click on it, scroll down, you find commerce, and then you click select. To keep your searches wide, don't do anything else, just select the course, the subject, and just click search. If it has more than 50 classes to offer, you'll see this message, do you want to proceed? Typically, yes you do. So you just click OK, wait for it to load. The more classes that subject offers, the longer it'll take to load. Typically, it's up to a minute. Uh, it's faster today. There we go. So now, what you see is all the classes that are in commerce that are offered at McMaster for that specific term. So before I go into the actual class, I want to go over this legend. So there's three colors and three shades you'll see. If it's a circle in green, it means that class is open for registration and you, have, you can get a seat as long as you meet the prereq, uh, the prereqs. The blue square means it's closed, that means it's full. So you cannot get into those classes. And the triangle, the yellow triangle, there's a wait list, um, and that will be dealt through um, one of the academic advisors. Uh, there's not many classes that do wait listing, but there are a few that may do it. So you have to contact your academic advisor, just read an email, go and visit them in the office, um, and then they'll kind of figure out if, if it's too long of a wait list or not. Just the three legends. So basically, I'm going to go to a class. Sadly, I cannot register in any of the classes that you have to take because I've already completed them. So I'm going to find a random class that I need the prereqs for. So you see the entire process. I'm literally just searching. There we go. Okay. Let's say I love finance. Uh, and this class right here is what I want. So Commerce 4FU3, Behavioral Finance. So once you found the class that you either need or are interested in, I can see straight off the bat, it has a green circle, that means it's an open class. So I'm gonna click select class. So now, this is a little bit more about the class that I just selected. So you see that the open again, uh, and then here you see the prerequisite requirements. So it says that you must have Commerce 3 FA3, which is a third year mandatory class for finance, and everybody has to take it, and it be registered in level three or above. Okay, so I meet both the requirements, uh, and I can move forward. Let's say if you don't meet the requirement and you try to move forward, it will not process that. It will automatically stop. You don't meet the requirements, you cannot enroll in this class. Okay? So I, I'm okay with this. What I'm gonna do, I know now is that I'm in section one, so that's core one. So core one is basically your lectures, is your sections uh, as you would have different classes. So you might have two math classes. They, they don't really need much, it's just the different times they're offered at. You know what day the classes are, you know which rooms the classes are on campus, and you know who the professors are. So I'm gonna click next. It is now added to my shopping cart. So shopping cart is basically the exact same thing if you do online shopping. You basically select the sizes, everything else that you need to know, and add it to your cart. And once you have everything ready to go, you just click proceed or check out. Similar concept. So what you can do is you can actually have all of the classes you want. So you can have all of your five classes in your shopping cart one at a time. You can add them and you can go to step two of three all together rather than doing one class at a time. So I'm just doing one as an example, but you can have five in the, of the same way. Um, and then you basically click proceed to step two out of three. So you won't be able to proceed until it's your enrollment time. It'll give you an error. It will say uh, you're not you're not registered to enroll currently. Uh, just keep it in your cart, and it will let you proceed to the next step once you have the enrollment date and you actually have the, the time as well. 
So for me, my time was last week, so I can actually proceed and show you what it looked like. So I click here. This is a confirmation. It's like, all right, are you sure this is the class you want? This is the time, this is what it is. These are the prereqs. Uh, and then finish enrolling is all I click on. I'm not gonna do it because I don't really want this class, uh, but, but that's it. You click finish enrolling. And you won't be able to come to this step unless you actually are after your time. So if you start at 8 a.m., if you go right at 8 a.m., you can come to this step. But before that, you will not be prompted to this step. Any questions? Yep? So, uh, generally, like, you would make your shopping cart before your, like, time's open. Yep. Like, when your time opens, you just post it to 30 seconds and you're done. Exactly. So, you can actually plan right now. Uh, and the sh once it's your enrollment time, you literally, it'll, it'll take you a minute or so. It took me 33, 34 seconds to register in all the classes for both my terms. Uh, but the, the way you might have a bigger challenge than what I did is that the way McMaster works is that fourth years go before third years, third years go before second years, second years go before first years. So you kind of get the short of the stick and your registration starts next week. Uh, so some of the classes that you might want, especially your electives, uh, they might be filled already. Uh, alluding about the cores, that you might be stuck with the 830 core rather than the 230 core. Uh, but yeah, so th there are reserved seats, uh, but it, you might be able to get to the class, it's just that not the time that you hope to be in your schedule. Yes? So, there's like classes that are at different times that have different Yes, or it's the same professor teaching at different times. Oh. Yeah, so it could be either or. It truly depends on the class itself. Uh, for most commerce classes in first year, it's the same professor teaching all cores. Uh, so as you would assume that, you know, 8.30 class is not a popular option. People rather choose afternoon classes. So all the afternoon classes might be filled by the time you get your enrollment time, but the class itself might still be open. It's just that you might have to take the 8.30 section or the section that has a class on Friday and Monday. Right, so that's that. Uh, so I actually want to show you something uh, that may help you. So this is going to be your best friend, uh, unless you love Excel, because I love Excel, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So time ta timetable generator. We're one of the lucky few universities that have our entire class system integrated to this website. So you select your university, so we want to do 1617. And what you can do is you can plan your multiple options, so like you know your ideal schedule, your backup of the ideal schedule, and your backup of a backup, just in case the, the cores you want to get into are full, or your electives that you want to get into are filled before you even get a chance to kind of log on. And what this is is basically it creates your schedule. So the exact same process I use as you do on Mosaic. So you would choose Commerce, click Next, you select the course. So I'm going to show you how the one I just chose. Four F. So there we go. So this is a bad example because it only has one core. But for classes that has multiple core, I'll show you another example. Actually, I'll show you that one. And what it does, it shows you, it creates a schedule for you right away. Right? So you kind of already have an idea of what your schedule is going to look like. So for a class that, uh, you just add another course. So let's say it's something that you'll be taking, uh, Commerce 103. So now you see there's four different cores. Let's say I want to do core one, and there's a lot of tutorials. So let's say tutorial 20, uh, and there we go. So term two, it populates it for me. So this is a good way to sort of plan your process to so actually visualize your content. Uh, but you could also do that on Mosaic. 
because you know you have it says your data time, what time times your classes are. Uh, but yeah, so like I recommend using that. Or if you love Excel, which I kind of depend on, what I do is that there's multiple courses offered. I create my own Excel sheet and kind of plot all the possible options, uh, just because it's easier for me to play on Excel than to play on this and wait for the internet to kind of load. Uh, but you can do two both things and the same effective uh, and the same result at the end of the day. Any other questions on that actual registration? Yeah. On was it? So it would be the exact same way. So if this class had a tutorial, it wouldn't let me finish enrolling until I also select a tutorial. So let's say if I were to So I'm gonna do a quick search so you see how it will look like for less uh, commerce one A three. So you basically subject to selecting commerce, searching. So you see, anything that starts with a C is your lectures. You see there's three lectures. Uh, actually, one of your three would be a better option. Oh, it's not offered. Okay. Uh, you need to select the tutorial first before you do the tutorial. Uh, no, but you can see the tutorials as well. So there we go. That's a class. It, 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 it's a second year class, but you see how the first portion is all about lectures, so CO1, CO2, CO3. And then right below, if anything that starts with a T is your tutorial. So it lists, lists all the tutorial times as well. Um, and then once you select the core, it would ask you to select the tutorial before you can move on. So it's, it's integrated into it, into your actual selecting process. Any other questions? Okay, so once you have enrolled after your enrollment date, a few hours after, you would see a list like this. And these are all the classes that you registered in, in that specific term. So this is for only 2016, fall. And what you could do is this is your final check, the same concept of the, week, the weekly schedule, and this is your weekly schedule on the class. It has the exact same information as the timetable generator. The class with the exact classes, what core, what, what is it, if it's a lecture or a tutorial, uh, the times, and the location. So everything is there for you right off the bat. So that's your enrollment of the class. Um, you can do multiple at the same time, but I highly recommend having a few backups just in case the cores that you want to get into are full. Uh, and then sometime in mid, mid to late July to early August, right here where it says you have no signing ch charges, your tuition is going to show, so you're, it's going to say your tuition is so and so, your entrance scholarship is going to be credited off, uh, and then the total the total amount that's due is going to be a little similar box as you see up here, but for the finance financing here. So moving to the second point, which is the finance, this is where you check all your bursaries, your uh, your scholarships, uh, applying for scholarships. That's anything to do with uh, money. It's here. Uh, so there's a few options for your uh, when you do your taxes, your T2, uh, your T2, T2As. Uh, you can find them here as well. Uh, so that's your finance hub. An academic hub, other than enrolling, you can see proof of enrollment. You can add, draw, swap. You can see your transcripts, um, and you can see what the requirements are for every year that you move forward with. So everything is in the academic hub. So now everybody just pretend you don't see my address because I'm going to go on the personal information hub. Um, this is basically your hub for all your personal information. So that's your permanent address, so it's right there at the bottom. Uh, your emergency contact, your, your temporary address if you're staying off campus or staying on residence, your phone number, best way to reach you, your secondary email if your McMaster servers are down, how will they communicate. So that is like very key to keep up to date, especially if you're moving or having a new number change over and over again. Uh, so keep that updated because that's how McMaster, that's the only way McMaster can get in touch with you is whatever is in that little personal hub. In terms of Mosaic, that this is basically the only tab you need to worry about. Uh, 
you wouldn't have the faculty center. Uh, that's only for TAs, if there are TA for any other classes. Uh, my work, if you don't work for McMaster in any way or form, you won't have much in there either. So this is basically your student center. Let's say you get lost at some point in the future. Student Guide has six different options for you to kind of go step by step or have to follow on videos uh, on what it is. So if it's academic related, personal information, financial matters, uh, some type of documentation, documentation that you need from McMaster or your faculty, it kind of kind of walks you through on uh, how to get it, which button to click, which link to click. So it kind of walks you through on that aspect. So key dates. Um, so the 15, that was quite close. It's actually September 14 uh, to drop or make changes to your uh, term one classes uh, without getting that fee. For term two, it is longer, so you can actually keep editing your term two throughout the entire term one, as well up in the first two weeks in January. So again, you're not stuck with it just starting next week. You have lots of time to kind of look around for the classes that, you, that fit the best in your schedule. And then the canceling is what Lori mentioned about the withdrawal. Uh, November 4th is it will, you cannot drop the class after that day. Okay, and then March 10th is the second term. For payments, uh, so if you're not on OSAP, all your payment tuition for term one is due September 1st, 2016, which is just before you start classes. If you are on OSAP, you do get a leeway of 22 days, so your payments are due September 22nd, just because OSAP released funding in the first two weeks of September. For winter term, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, for winter term, January 1st is for non-OSAP students, and for OSAP student, it ends up being January 22nd. If you want to pay, make a payment, you can make a payment all for your entire full year, all at once in September. So that's up to you. In terms of making your payments, it's either through your banking, so it's interactive, or uh, credit card, but there is a fee of 1.75% if you are paying by the credit card, but that is an option if you choose to go that way. So we cover that. Okay, so you can have your phones out, you can take a picture, add a reminder. So the key dates, so you start registration for Business One June 29th. Uh, a few of you guys may have a later date, it's all randomized, but the earliest you have is the 29th. August 27th to September 3rd is the welcome week. Uh, welcome week, so that's basically where you will see hundreds of the green suits and other faculties dressed up in full suits, overalls. <laughs> August 30th is a faculty day, so basically it's a day where uh, all first year commerce students are going to be planning. Do you want to tell them what the faculty day is? Sure, it's the commerce carnival. Um, so essentially, we have all of our faculty together. Um, we have different speakers come in. If you're into accounting, we have someone from CPA that comes in and they give a little bit of a speech. Um, it's a great day, though, to get to know other people within your program because since you're in commerce, you have lots of your projects. So it's nice to know some familiar faces when you go into your classes and your tutorials. Um, so I think one of the most successful or key things to being successful in university is having good group members. Um, so yeah, you get to meet people from our faculty that day and also meet all of the reps. So in case we didn't have a chance to move you in or anything like that, you'll be able to meet all of us um, upper years. You can ask us questions. Uh, you also have a faculty night. Oh yeah, so it's not up here. Faculty night is the first. The Thursday, so, so September 1st, um, all first year students go with their faculty for faculty night. And you do fun, I'm not going to allude to what it is, so you have to come out and see what it is, but it's usually a very fun evening. And then there's also something called Faculty Fest, and that's a, an afternoon um, activity during Welcome Week. It's on the Wednesday, where you meet um, some actual faculty. So professors and teachers and whatnot, and the Degree Commerce Society, that student council I told you about, is pretty active in that event, and you'll be able to meet those leaders. That's when you can find out more about um, ways that you can get involved. Yeah. Uh, so what's the limit for students of commerce? 27th and the 28th. Yeah, move in will be the 27th and 28th. It's allocated based on what residence you'll be living in. Do you guys know what residences you're in? Uh, yeah. No? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So then that day, you will find out afterwards. Um, half of you move in on the Saturday, half move in on the Sunday. Uh, you get more details about that. But. 
And the good thing is that the classes don't start until September 6th. So you have a full week of uh, welcome week. Then everybody has the long weekend off. So if you want to go back home um, or just kind of relax, you know, sleep in, you all have the opportunity to do that as well. Okay, so this is what you're going to take over here. So we've kind of mentioned a couple of these events or things that, um, ways you can get involved in your first year. I cannot stress enough how, much, how important it is to get involved. I'm sure you've heard it by so, from so many people, and you even heard it when you were in high school. Um, but your experience at McMaster University is only a fraction made in the classroom. Um, and at least mine was, and I can honestly say that my most memorable experiences and what made my university uh, experience as great as it was, was everything outside of the classroom. Yeah, you're here to get an education and a degree at the end of the day, but you might as well enjoy yourself while you're doing it. That's the way I see it. So, the great thing is, is that we have a lot of different clubs um, and societies and committees, whatever you want to call it, that host events and do different different events, I would say, that tier, uh, cater towards both academic but also social aspects. So if we talked a little bit about Faculty Night and Faculty Day, come out to those. Um, they're open for everyone. It's a great way to meet people. Even if you think it might not be your thing, there's no harm in coming out for 10 minutes. If you really want to leave, we are not handcuffing you to be there. You can leave if you want. But at least you tried it and you saw. What was that? So there's that. Um, throughout the year, the DCS will host different events um, at our social events. So we have Mystery Road Bus. Um, you buy a ticket, and we put you on a bus, and we bring you to a mystery destination that you don't know what it is. Sounds really fun. Yeah, it is. Um, Clubs Fest. So Clubs Fest, there's a big master-wide Clubs Fest that happens during Welcome Week. Um, uh, each faculty, the MSU in general, has clubs that come out, and you can see the different clubs that are there and join them. Um, also, some of the sports teams have them. Then the group it itself has its own mini Clubs Fest, per se. It's called, uh, it happens afterwards. And you can, that's how you can find out how you can be involved in the DeGroote Finance Association or the DeGroote Accounting Association. Um, then if you're into accounting, there's CPA Night, which I highly recommend uh, going to if you want to somehow land a job for the summer in accounting and things like that. It's a great way to network. Um, talk about the DCS, first year council. So back when I was in first year, I was the first year rep. Um, and the first year rep is in charge of helping along with the first year council, which Susha was actually on my first year council with me back in the day while we were old. Um, and you're in charge of leading a bunch of events for first year. So they have a dodgeball tournament, there's different social things that go on. It changes year to year, but it's a great, if you want to somehow get involved, I'm not sure how when you're in first year, apply to do that. I could definitely say I met a lot of my commerce friends because I was involved with the DCS and the first year rep. So it was an awesome experience, sure. Uh, Commerce Formal happens in January. It's just like exactly what it sounds like, a formal. It's a great time though, again. I, I'm i being biased, a lot of my friends are in Commerce and I really love the faculty, so I like going to events like this. Um, but if you're not, a, Commerce Formal isn't your thing, the MSU has a formal, every faculty has one. So if you have lots of dresses to wear, there's lots of different formals you can go to. And then company information sessions. Yeah? Wait, did you go to the other things formal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Commerce was the best. Yeah, Commerce was the best one. So it's a it's a fun night. Um, company information session. So a lot of companies do hire from from McMaster students, whether it be summer jobs or jobs after you're graduating. So those company information sessions, you can sign up for on Oscar Plus. Do you guys know what Oscar Plus is? No. Okay. Oscar Plus is this website um, that's used for, it's basically a Liquid Master's job board for jobs for McMaster students that other companies post on our website. So there's a business student section where there's jobs specifically tailored for business students. You'll use Oscar Plus when you're in that internship course, 3 I and O, to apply for jobs. But there's also jobs that are not related to internship that are open to everyone. So if you kind of are interested, Google it, check it out. You should be able to log in with your Mac ID and just fool around and see how it works. But Oscar Plus is a pretty cool tool. That's where you'll register for these company information sessions. Lots of companies hire from here. And even just coming out, to, if you're not trying to get a job, but just find out more about the company. I used to work for Labatt and I was the McMaster Labatt campus rep. And I was in charge of organizing these company information sessions. And a lot of students that came out were in first year that were not looking for a job, but they just wanted to find out more about Labatt per se. There's always food included, so like 
It's a great, it's a great reason to come out in itself. You'll learn pretty fast that there's free food at a lot of these things. So, yeah. That's, any questions about events? No? Yes? Okay. Thanks, Alex. Um, when you're, how many students are going to be moving into residence? Show of hands. And how many will be living at home? Okay, so I have two reps here from the Society of Off-Campus Students. When you're moving into residence, you're going to partake in all your Welcome Week activities with the people in your residence, but also with the green suits. But for the students who will be living at home, we have a special society for you, and we're going to hear more about that. Hi, hey, so my name is Nero, and I'm an off-campus rep, as I previously mentioned. So I really highly recommend all of you guys coming up to Welcome Week, because the reason why we decided to be reps is so that you guys can have an awesome transition. One quick thing I want to mention is that our theme is accessibility. So we want to make sure all you off-campus students feel just as welcome as all the on-campus students. So you can be a community student for four years and still find a way to contribute to society. I've done that. I'm, I'm a community student from Mississauga. I take the go bus every day, and I tend to do so in my final year. And I've still found ways to interact with society, whether it be being a TA, being a welcome rep. You guys will find many, many opportunities to involve yourself with the group. You find them and really want them. And I know you guys will. And now, Hi guys, my name is Anika. And like uh, Nero said, that there are many opportunities to get involved. The first step to getting involved is actually showing up at on Welcome Week. That's your first step to get involved because I, I read your uh, questionnaires and a lot of you guys said that you were afraid of getting involved, like you might not get involved. So that's the first step. And in addition, this year we started something new. It's called uh, the Welcome Week Sneak Peek. So we're doing it for different cities. So we have it for Mississauga, we have it for Toronto. Later in, in July, we have it for West Hamilton. So if you plan to be like in, in Hamilton, if you're in that time here, or if you're in Mississauga or Toronto, it's on our Facebook page. So I know the ones that are in Mississauga, they're going to a trampoline park, and it's completely free. So it's just a bonding event for like for incoming first years and the reps, and we can give you advice whenever you want. Also, our registration, like for SOX re registration, will be open, so you're allowed to buy memberships in well, during Welcome Week. I'm not sure about what the price is this year, but you can easily do that. And if you have any more questions about living off campus or commuting, feel free to ask me or Nero. We'll just pass it on. Oh. Okay, I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. I know you guys have been bombarded with information like all after. So, um, I mentioned earlier about the FYO program, which stands for First Year Orientation Program. Essentially what it is, is it's a mentorship program where first years are matched with an upper year student. And that mentorship lasts for the entire year and potentially for the rest of your lives if you guys become friends. Um, during Welcome Week, uh, like Alex was saying before, you get to meet a bunch of green suit reps and they'll be walking around. You might find something in common with one of them, and you can email the, that email down there. You'll be getting um, another copy of that email later on during Welcome Week. You can send an email to that email there and say, hey, I met so-and-so during Welcome Week. I want them to be my mentor for the year, and you'll get matched up with that mentor, and throughout the year, it's just someone that you can hang out with, have coffee with, uh, my mentor actually gave me like old exams and old like notes that he took for his classes, which was great study tools for me. And also throughout the year, we hold social events and academic study workshops. So you have like an upper year student helping you out throughout the year. Yeah. Thank you, Della. So quickly, I just want to make sure you are aware that we do have our own student wellness center in the basement of the student center. So the student center is a real hub where all your services are available. If you're going to do a tour at the end, we'll certainly, I'm sure, take you through the student center. In the basement is the student wellness center. It is where you can go if you're sick and you need medical attention. So it's like a, like a drop-in medical uh, health center. If you're going to miss any components of your coursework, like in a midterm or a, a test or quiz, and you need medical documentation because you're going to miss that, you can go there and get um, the forms filled out, but also get the medical attention that you need because we really want you to get well so you can get back on the path to good health. 
Also, down in the basement is student accessibility services. So if, are, if there are any students who have any type of disability, we have the student accessibility services available for you. I do have some brochures at the front um, about their services, whether it's a learning disability or whatever you may be suffering from. You can get registered with them and they will provide you with accommodations for whatever you need according to your disability, whether you need longer periods to uh, do your tests, if you need to test in a separate room, whatever your needs, they will assess you and provide you with what you need. So please, if you do require that help, please reach out and register with them because it's very uh, important that you get the help that you need. Also, the Student Success Center is just off the uh, Student Center in Gilmore Hall, and it is an area where you can go for help uh, regarding your academic skills development. So I am an academic advisor. I help you in making sure you get through your degree right, that you have all the right courses, that we make sure you're, you're navigating through the courses you need to take. The Student Success Center will help you if you have problems with procrastination, time management, stress management, um, how to write a good essay, how to do any of your academic skills. They have workshops all through the year and you can also get a personal academic skills advisor that you can meet. You can take an essay in and they will help proof it to make sure you have the proper grammar and structure because we have very strict rules um, regarding essays here at the university. So please be sure to tap into those resources should you need them. This is my team. Um, there are four academic advisors as well as Sriani in the middle. So the first, Angela and Lori, that's me. Sriani is the exchange coordinator, and then we do have another Lori, Lori Johnston and Barb. Um, two Lori's, so, and they are both blonde, so if you come in to the office and say, well, I met Lori the other day, which Lori, I don't know, but she was blonde, we have a problem. Um, I tend to call myself, I am the older Lori, and I'm the old Lady Hill, uh, or over the hill. But um, if you need to come and meet us, please do. We are all very dedicated to help you. Barb, at the end, just uh, she just celebrated her 40th year at McMaster. So she's a wealth of knowledge and um, a very caring person, as we all are. How's everybody feeling? Good? School just finished. School just finished, yes. But how are you feeling about coming in September? Does this help? Are we happy? Are we excited? Are we terrified? Still? Anxious? Um, what we're going to do next is I would like the parents to come down and we're going to go with my, my boss, Greg Rombo, I'd like to introduce you to. He's the manager of our Student Experience Academic Undergraduate Office. He's going to take the parents into a room just to have a little chat for five minutes. Um, the students can stay here because we're almost ready to wrap up, but if you'd like to go with Greg, please uh, feel free to go with him.